like you said, it's a very um, heterogeneous region. Uh, it's, it's kind of it's as hard to compare places like Poland, which you know have seen almost like an, an economic boom, with kind of laggards like Romania, when the Slovenia is also a case apart. So it's uh, it's it's an interesting place, and I'm, I'm curious, kind of what what your theory is of, of why it is so interesting and so apart. I was certainly deeply influenced by uh, growing up in, in Slovenia, newly independent, right? I only experienced about three years of communism. As a three-year-old, your, your sociopolitical views aren't very sophisticated, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you, you hear from your parents, you hear from your relatives. For them, it was yesterday, right? When you're growing up for them, it was just a few years ago. Even if for you, it's like, you know, almost since before you were born. Uh, and let alone conversations with grandparents, where my grandparents even had experience of the pre-communist world of pre-communist uh, Slovenia and Yugoslavia. So they had the most perspective in a way. Um, and the, the transition from one political system to the next, I think very much influenced my view where uh, one of the conversations I recall having relatively early with my dad is uh, he made the point, you know, someone, no one made me retake economics after the end of socialism. My economics degree remained valid and I continued to have basically the same job doing basically the same things as the CFO uh, of an energy company. Mm -hmm. To me, that was, it blew my mind, right, as a 10-year-old because I took ideas, I think, a little bit too seriously. <laughs> the, the funny part is, why would the system of social differentiation stay the same if the entire basis of legitimacy of the system completely turned on its head? Um, and I think that a lot of people tend to think this, one differentiation, you ask the question, why is it a heterogeneous region? I think one of them is, in many of these places, it was in fact the exact same people that remained in charge after the fall of communism than before. Romania is the most extreme case, but note, Romania is the only case where the former communist leader was put on trial and put to death. Mm -hmm. right? It's the only such case. In Poland, uh, they have lustration where if you were of a particular rank in the communist state, you could no longer you could no longer hold office. Basically, you were kicked out of government. In Slovenia, there was basically strong continuity, right? There was no barrier to being a former communist official and being a democratically elected leader. In fact, nearly all the politicians had continuity through this period. Part of that difference might be places that were. Communism was mostly a Russian imposition versus, say, Yugoslavia, where Tito's revolution occurred semi-independently, though, of course, with British and Soviet support. Mm -hmm. uh, and places where, you know, like, say, in, in, in Ukraine or Belarus, right, like communism was also a domestic phenomenon because they used to be part of the Russian Empire versus you go to the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic, for all intents and purposes, was kind of an Eastern European sorry, a Western European country. They had enough industrial potential in the 1940s that Germany's industrial potential went up a little bit when they annexed Bohemia, as it was, as it was called and as it's still called. Uh, so it, it's, a dis, it's a differentiated region. So some of the underdevelopment, I think, is just a consequence of, it's not Western versus Eastern Europe, it's Western Europe versus the world. Western Europe just ran ahead very fast with the Industrial Revolution, right? And had a significant development advantage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Japan was way behind until arguably as late as the 1970s. And they had started trying to catch up in the 1870s, right? With, you know, the interlude of World War II and the destruction of that. But still, it was clearly a trend line of industrialization, development, modernization. Uh, Russia arguably attempted this catch up, this long catch up, completely failed. So I think part of the reason definitely is in the prolonged uh, period, the prolonged period of uh, communist rule. And I think there was a failure to do economic development as well as say Western Europe did, or say today China does, despite China also nominally being communist. But I also believe the sheer destructiveness of the world wars was felt more by Eastern Europe than Western Europe, mm -hmm. right? The world's highest GDPs per capita in 1946 were, uh, I think it was like, you know, the United States, Switzerland, and Denmark. 
So basically only Denmark was occupied and only lightly occupied, right? So all the places that weren't trashed by World War II. So I do think that that's a big factor. Um, another factor was, as I said, that they were late to industrializations, that they were adopters, second, third adopters, rather than the origin of the Industrial Revolution, as say Britain and maybe Belgium were, and then a little bit later also Germany and to a lesser extent France and America. Um, th these two differences, I think, actually explain most of it. I think uh, explanations related to, oh, the Orthodox Christian world versus the Catholic world, I think they're exaggerations. I think, say, the cultural differences between the Orthodox and Catholic world, while very important, right? Orthodox being, you know, Russia, uh, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, Greece, uh, Catholic being, you know, Italy, uh, you know, uh, France. D these are comparable to the differences between the Catholic world and the Protestant world. Right. No one's going to convince me that, say, you know, I'm staying in Portugal right now, you know, hiding from COVID in quarantine like everyone else is. Portugal, I think, is as different from Sweden as, say, France is from Russia. Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't think the difference between France and Russia is that much greater than the difference between, say, Portugal and Sweden. Right there. The, the, um, the integration of the common world is very much the same. And Russian leaders have been looking towards the West and emulating the West for a very long time. St. Petersburg, Russia's second most important city, founded by Peter the Great, who literally spent time incognito in the West. I think it was in the Netherlands, uh, looking at how ships are built. Mm -hmm. But he literally went on a personal expedition with his retinue to, to find the experts who knew how to build ships and built a new port city in Russia to make it westward facing, but even engaged in cultural reforms like taxing beards to try to just get the <laughs> Russians to look more Western. Right? Yeah. So Russia has been a peripheral part of the European system for a very long time. It's been reforming itself to match innovations. Sometimes it even produced innovations such as say cultural innovations like ballet as we know it, right, developed in Russia, um, 19th century Russian literature. Uh, but there was a grand social experiment that failed. There was terrible devastation from the worst war in the last 200 years. And, you know, finally, it just wasn't the core. It was the periphery. It wasn't mm -hmm. the place where the Industrial Revolution started. I... And, you know, today, today in Eastern Europe, these different legacies still reflect, right? I mentioned, say, you know, Poland and, and the Czech Republic, if the geopolitics of World War II were a little bit different, these would have been Western European countries by most people's reckoning. Right? Mm -hmm. And the other difference is, do you have continuity with the previous government or do you have a complete break with the previous government? 